Greetings and salutations and welcome back to Colin's Last Stand right here on YouTube. My name is Colin Moriarty. I appreciate you being here with me today. And I also appreciate your patience, by the way, as I continue to get everything together. The studio is coming together. I'm here again in the studio in Santa Monica. I'm doing the best I can. I'm reading your feedback. I'm trying to make the videos the best they can be, both from a video quality, but more importantly, from an audio standpoint. I'm actually having some challenges in this room with the acoustics because there are so many little ridges and weird things going on in the ceiling and like a, a window over there and stuff like that. So I think it's going to sound better this video than the Nixon video. And I apologize. We're, we're grappling with that. And by we, I mean, Erin and I, she's been a great help throughout this entire endeavor. Also, if you're following along from the prelude of the previous video, the Nixon slash Watergate video, got a haircut. Jersey Mike's still closed. No electricity in the building. Really kind of distressing, actually. All right, so today I want to talk about Confederate remembrance in the United States. And I think that this is an interesting topic, not only for us here in the United States in America, but for everyone around the world. Because I'm a little disturbed, frankly, personally, about the reverence that some people hold the Confederates in and how Confederate remembrance and the remembrance of the Confederate States of America seems to be something that 150 years, 152 years really, after... The Confederacy fell, we still have these arguments and we still have to deal with the, the, the stars and bars and we still have to deal with the statues of the Confederate leaders and etc. and so on. And it's something that I want to deal with here right now, tell you how I feel about it. And I'm also curious about how you feel about it. So I'll be reading the comments as always and we can chat down there as well. If you're confused and you're asking yourself, what the fuck is the Confederacy? Well, that's why you're watching Collins Last Stand, isn't it? The Confederacy was a secessionist movement in the United States that began in December of 1860 into 1861, where a total of 11 states left the United States to form their own country called the CSA, or the Confederate States of America. This is significant for lots of reasons, but it's significant for one particular reason, in my opinion. The secession causes the bloodiest conflict the United States has ever seen before. Of course, the Civil War is way more dynamic than simple battlefields and battles and generals and deaths, although those things are important. There are sectional rivalries going on that have to be played out. There are constitutional questions being asked about, for instance, the legality of secession and what we should do about it. And of course, the American question of slavery needs to be answered as well, and it is answered by 1865, when the war is over and the CSA is left in ruins. Now, this seems like a timely topic for me to bring up because right now we are dealing with some people being upset that Confederate statues are being removed in places like New Orleans. And of course, this question had been raging over the last couple of years as well with the use of the Confederate flag, what's called in nomenclature, the stars and bars, whether the stars and bars are displayed outside of courthouses in the South or outside of other public buildings. There was even a question of the inclusion of the Confederate flag in some Southern state flags. Now, I want to be really clear. I don't challenge anyone's ability to, on their private property, display, for instance, the Confederate flag. If you want to hang the Confederate flag on your property outside of your porch, that's totally your prerogative. I think you should have the right to do that. I don't necessarily think it even makes you a racist. See, the massive issue with the CSA, Confederate Remembrance, the statues of important people in the Confederacy being displayed all over the South, the stars and bars still flying prominently 150 years or so after the Civil War ended, these questions are all loaded because it has to do with the implications of Southern pride, Southern heritage, and what those symbols mean to being an American Southerner. And see, I think that that's a really unfortunate thing because... I've been to the South a lot. I've spent, as a Northerner, more time in the South than many Northerners ever will. And the reason for that simply is because I have so much family down there. As you guys know, we all started on Long Island, but slowly but surely, very few of us are actually left on the island. My dad and a couple aunts and uncles, etc., cousins, whatnot, are the only ones left on the island. My sister Dana moved to North Carolina and then later to Virginia in the late 90s. My other sister Allie has lived in Virginia for well over a decade. My mom lives down there. Uh, my aunt and uncle and cousin live down there. More people are relocating. They're all trying to kind of be together and, and kind of keep that family feeling going. And so they've all, they've all relocated to the area surrounding Richmond, Virginia, which happens to be the Confederate capital. And when I first went down to the South in the 90s, I was immediately puzzled as a fan of history how there was so much appreciation for Confederate generals, Confederate statesmen, and all that kind of stuff down there. In addition to seeing the stars and bars flying on flagpoles, outside of people's houses, on stickers on the back of pickup trucks and cars, on license plates, whatever the case might be. I was immediately confused by this. Because as a Northerner, I learned that the Civil War was a war between the states, 
the Union won, and the Confederacy was vanquished. But in the South, they learn about the Confederacy in a different way. Sometimes it's called the War of Northern Aggression, and other ridiculous names that hide the fact that this was a sectional conflict started by the Southerners. See, what I really love about the South are the people. I've met so many great people down there. The Southern people are a warm people. They're a friendly and kind people. They're genteel and they care about things and they care about you and they're interested in you and, and they move a little bit slower and they talk a little bit slower because time just seems to move a little bit slower in the South. And I always kind of liked that. I like eating the food. I like drinking the drinks. I like having a good time down there and the, and the beautiful weather amongst really great people. And I've always been distressed that there are some Southerners, not many, or certainly not all Southerners, but some Southerners that tie their own heritage and their own Southern pride to this dead symbol, this flag, and this frankly traitorous movement. And it's disturbing. And it goes right on back to the flag, and it goes right on back to those statues. And I hate this argument that everyone's saying, well, you're destroying history and you're destroying remembrance. No, we're not. We're not destroying history. We're not destroying remembrance. We know what happened at Chancellorsville. We know what happened at Appomattox. We know what happened up in the north at places like Gettysburg. We go to those places. I've been to many of these battlefields. They're awesome. And the fascination with the war between the states is one I understand. In fact, the Civil War, the American Civil War, was the very first thing in American history that I was absolutely obsessed with. This goes all the way back to the early 90s and the mid-90s. I was absolutely obsessed with learning about the Civil War, obsessed with those four years frozen in time, the characters that we had to deal with, the Abraham Lincolns and the Jefferson Davises and the Robert E. Lees and the Ulysses Grants. There's so much to really enjoy about the Civil War from a, from a bird's eye view and from in the weeds as well, from a history standpoint and a political standpoint. It's an important thing to learn from. But why is there such an insistence on pretending that this war didn't happen the way it happened, that it wasn't fought over the reasons it was fought over and that those symbols aren't loaded because even today in 2017, those symbols really mean something. And you don't have to separate your remembrance of a, of a man like Robert E. Lee and what he meant to military history or his tactics and his strategies and the brilliance of his mind. You don't have to separate that from the war necessarily. You can have a respect for Robert E. Lee. It's kind of like how people have a respect for Rommel, the great you know Desert Fox, the German Nazi general, who if you just took him alone as he was was an interesting man worth studying. And even terrible people like Adolf Hitler are worth studying and understanding. But that doesn't mean that we erect statues in their remembrance. Now, yes, I don't like to invoke Nazi Germany. I'm not comparing the Confederacy to Nazi Germany. It wasn't nearly as bad as Nazi Germany. I understand that. But there was a central focal point that actually is shared with Nazi Germany, which was racial supremacy. That's what the Confederacy was all about. It was fought over the retention of slavery. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you or doesn't understand history, period. What I want to do is get to a point where we can kind of separate Confederate remembrance and the Confederacy and the Civil War from this point of Southern pride that is very valid and important. The Southern states in America are a culturally and socially unique place that should be celebrated. I love the South and I think that's really important. But this is my plea, especially to Southerners and especially to Southerners that still fly the stars and bars and still think that Stonewall Jackson should have a fucking shrine to him in Virginia and we should still have a statue of Jefferson Davis and we should still have all of these things going on in the South. This is my plea to you to rethink your stance because yes, the Civil War was fought over the retention of the institution of slavery and extraneous issues around slavery still directly connected to that institution like the economy and like nullification and like states rights and all those kinds of things that people like to bring up to excuse the fact that all of that's still tied into slavery. The war was fought over states rights, someone, someone might say, and they say that with great conviction, not realizing that the states rights had to do with slavery and the retention of slavery. And this, this problem that had been brewing since, since the Northwest Ordinance was passed in 1787, which created the very first territory and outlawed slavery in the territory and created this, this mathematical problem in the Congress, in the House, and the Senate, in which there felt like there needed to be parity between slave states and free states. Otherwise, the fear was, especially in the South, that the free states would overwhelm the slave states and eradicate slavery really completely. And this is played out in 1820 in the Missouri Compromise when Missouri and Maine are brought into the Union. And this is also played out later on in 1854 with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, with the idea of popular sovereignty, which brought about the, the bleeding Kansas crisis, the basic idea that people within local territories, within states, within jurisdictions can decide whether they wanted to be free states or slave states. This all became very political, but 
you have to understand the Civil War was decades in the making. The Southern economy was so dependent on slavery, especially after the late 1790s when Eli Whitney created the cotton gin, therefore making cotton easier to process and making the need to cultivate more cotton, that slavery couldn't die without the way of life in the CSA or what would become the CSA also dying. And they were unwilling to bend. These traders were protecting an economy, a very lucrative economy that they referred to as King Cotton, in which two thirds, my friends, two thirds, two of every three pounds of cotton cultivated in the entire world were cultivated not by Americans, but by American slaves. Let's also be clear about the price that we paid during the Civil War in terms of lives. 620,000 soldiers died during the Civil War, during the war between the states, during this war which, which pitted brother against brother, which former countrymen versus former countrymen. To put that into context for you, there were only 31 million people in both the U.S. and what would become the Confederacy during the 1860 census before the CSA split off. That means that about 1 in 50 people in the U.S. died during the Civil War on a battlefield. And if you want to kind of extrapolate those numbers to today, that number would be more like 6 or 6.5 million people dead when you compare per capita the deaths experienced during the Civil War. This was a bloody, disgusting, unnecessary, horrific conflict perpetrated to protect an immoral and, 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 and disgusting and unnecessary and evil slavery system for their economic benefit. And in the process, 620,000 Americans and Confederates, they're all Americans, but you know, both sides die, which is the equivalent, by the way, of how many people died on our side during the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, all of our forays into the Middle East, and all these other conflicts we fought over the last 200 plus years combined. That's how bloody the Civil War was. But yes, let's erect plaques and, and statues and, and memorials to the great heroes of the Civil War. What a fantastic idea and what an awesome hill to die on. Certainly sends the right message of unity that we need in the United States today, doesn't it? And so let's not deny what it was fought over, number one. And if we won't deny what it was fought over, then indeed we should also not deny that those symbols and the stars and bars and the CSA and Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, they're all connected to this idea of American slavery and this terrible institution that we should do our best to move on from. But there's another element to this. There's another massive element to this that I think is often overlooked when we're arguing about the war between the states, when we're arguing about the personnel in the war, and we're, when we're arguing about why the war was fought. The argument is that the men who perpetrated the Civil War, who created the CSA, and who fought their brothers on the battlefield in the North, they were traitors. They were traitors. I wanna be very clear about that again. Robert E. Lee was a fucking traitor. Jefferson Davis, a traitor. Stonewall Jackson, a traitor. These were all traitors, and they don't deserve to be celebrated with any sort of reverence. And their memory, my Southern friends, are not intimately tied to your heritage or to your pride. So let's separate them once and for all. I remember when I went to Richmond, Virginia for the first time, a city I've spent a ton of time in since, a really lovely city full of lovely people, and they have a thing there called Monument Row, which is this beautiful road in Richmond lined by these really stately houses, and at every intersection or so is a grand statue. There's Jefferson Davis. There's Robert E. Lee. It's a little strange, right? Don't you think that that's a little weird? But do you want to know the kind of traders that we're dealing with? Because I really want to get into this, just so you know how deeply I feel about this particular issue. That when you even leave the institution, the evil institution of slavery behind, when you even lead up, uh, leave out the lead up into the war behind, when you leave out all of the extraneous things, here are the Confederate traders that you're celebrating down there in the South, some of you, that you want to erect statues to and keep these statues up. And here's where they came from, what happened to them, and what they did. Are you ready? Jefferson Davis was the Confederate president. He hailed from Mississippi, where he was both before the war a House member and a senator, and he was also Secretary of War in the cabinet of Franklin Pierce, the president right before the Civil War, right before James Buchanan and then the Civil War began. After the war, was, was Jefferson Davis punished? No, he wasn't punished. He was the president of Texas A&M University. He wrote some books and he lived pretty well. 
Alexander Stevens, the Confederate vice president, hailed from Georgia, served in the House of the Representatives pre-war representing Georgia. He, after the war, was back in the House of Representatives somehow representing Georgia and even served as the governor of Georgia. Judah Benjamin, the Confederate Attorney General, Secretary of War, and most notably he was the Secretary of State of the Confederate States of America. Before the war, he was a senator from the state of Louisiana. And he fled like a coward to the UK after the war, and he practiced law in the UK. Christopher Memminger, writer of the Confederate Constitution, sort of their broke-down, broke-ass, store-brand version of James Madison. He was the Confederate Secretary of the Treasury and a prominent member of the South Carolina state government before the war began. And after the war, was he punished? No. He was allowed to go back and work in business and education. James Seddon, who was the Confederate Secretary of War before the war, he also served in the U.S. House. He was from Virginia. And he was allowed to just completely retire in peace after the war. Ah, there's Stephen Mallory, the Confederate Secretary of the Navy. Before the war, he represented his home state of Florida in the Senate. And afterwards, was he punished? No, he went back and practiced law in Florida and lived a pretty good life. Ah, uh, Robert E. Lee, the greatest traitor of them all. He was the CSA's general-in-chief. He was a Virginian and really one of the architects of the war and a great military mind. Of that, there is no doubt. Understand that Abraham Lincoln directly went to Robert E. Lee, who was a decorated war hero in the United States before the Civil War, asked him to lead the, the war effort on the Union behalf. He declined. Then he became a traitor, went to the CSA, talked to Jefferson Davis, and led their troops as well. Robert Robert E. Lee, before the war, was the superintendent of the U.S. military. He served for three decades with distinction in, in wars like the Mexican-American War. And afterwards, he became the president of Washington and Lee University. He didn't pay any price for his traitorous deeds. James Longstreet was another CSA general. He was from Georgia. He served with distinction in the U.S. Army before the war and fought in the Mexican-American War like so many of his Confederate traitor comrades. He joined the, the Republican Party somehow after the war and was kind of rehabilitated and back in the good graces of the government. He served the government in various uh, locales before his death. P.G.T. Beauregard was another Confederate general from Georgia who was also in the U.S. Army for a really long time, also fought in the Mexican-American War and joined the CSA upon secession because he too was a traitor. And afterwards, he worked in the Louisiana state government and was a, a writer and did some engineering pursuits, also allowed to live a great life. Braxton Bragg, another Confederate general from North Carolina, he served in the U.S. Army for two decades, fought in some Indian wars, Indian conflicts, and the Mexican-American War, and upon the CSA secession, he also joined up with them. Afterwards, he wasn't punished either. He worked in the local state governments in Louisiana, and eventually for a Texas railroad company. Nathan Bedford Forrest, another CSA general from Tennessee, he never even served in the military, actually, before the CSA can, uh, seceded, but he was a very rich man. He was a gambler and a business owner and, all, and an investor and all those kinds of things. He joins the CSA in 1861. Afterwards, he had multiple jobs, but most interestingly was a very early and prominent member of the Ku Klux Klan. Thank God he went without punishment. George Pickett, another CSA general from Virginia. He served in the U.S. Army. He fought in the Mexican-American War. He joined the, the CSA upon secession, and he fled like a, a coward to Canada after the war, but then came back to Virginia, and he worked and lived a good life until he died as well. And understand that even people that, that died in the war, like Stonewall Jackson, who is from Virginia, and Jeb Stewart, J.E.B. Stewart, who was also from Virginia, who died in 1864 and went to West Point before the war, these men are also celebrated like heroes, but they're all traitors. And the reason that I'm giving you that information about all of them is there's a commonality between all of them. Do you know what it is? It's that all of them were allowed without any sort of significant punishment to go about their lives after the war. But you know who wasn't allowed to go back to their lives after the war? The hundreds of thousands of people that died. The slaves that had to live after Reconstruction ended in, Jim, in the Jim Crow South where they were segregated, where they were lynched and hanged from trees and fucking terrorized for decades, for generations. They weren't allowed to live a normal life. And that's the thing, it all comes back to this for me personally, that we revere these men in places in the South, that these men like Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, are, are, the towns are named after them, roads are named after them, uh, schools are named after them, whatever it might be. But these traitors, these slave-owning traitors that fought to keep that institution in place when most of the rest of the modern world at the time had long since stopped with slavery, were not only allowed to be traitors, were not only allowed to try to secede from the United States, were not only responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, were not only responsible for the economic, societal, infrastructural 
decay and destruction of their own land. But after that, because of the giving and patient nature of Abraham Lincoln and later Andrew Johnson and their 10% plan and all of these kinds of legislative acts and these ideas and these notions about reunifying the nation, they were allowed to just go about their lives. Some of them were briefly imprisoned. You'll notice that with the exception of a couple of them who died during the war, none of them were executed. None, none of them were imprisoned for a long period of time. None of them were, for a long period of time, even kept out of the government. All they had to do was pledge allegiance back to the United States government, and like that, they were back in. But the men, the poor boys and men that died on battlefields, they didn't have a second chance. The slaves that were lynched, the slaves that were that were killed and murdered and raped, they didn't get a second chance. But Jefferson Davis, not only does he get a second chance, he gets to live a pretty good life, write some books, write some bestsellers. He gets to, you know, work in an insurance company. He gets statues erected to him. He has organizations named after him, roads, towns, whatever, bridges named after him. He's a traitor, my friends. He's a fucking traitor. If it seems like I'm passionate about this topic, it's because I am. Because I'm sick of having this argument in the United States today. These things, like Indiana Jones might suggest, belong in museums. I don't think that we should destroy and melt down and throw out a statue of Jefferson Davis. Find a private museum somewhere, bring it to the White House of the Confederacy. It's an amazing museum, an amazing building in Richmond that I've been to and I really enjoy. Let's put those things in places where they make sense. But does a statue of Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson make sense in a public place? Or do they make sense in a museum? This isn't about erasing history. It's about remembering history in ways that are, I think, most responsible. And not even responsible, but in my estimation, reasonable. The secessionist plot against the United States was foiled very easily. The Confederacy never had a chance. They never had a chance. Their economy was not ready for that war. They didn't have the personnel. They didn't have the manpower. Half of the populations of some of these states were slaves. So they were certainly not going to win a war with them. And it goes back to this idea, this distressing kind of idea that I have in my own mind that we have to, again, separate, instead of putting at the nexus, this idea of Southern pride and Southern remembrance and the South will rise again and the lost cause and all this bullshit that is said. The South is good enough on its own as it is. It's a beautiful and lovely place full of beautiful and lovely people. Separate yourself from those memories by getting rid of those statues in public places, by tearing down the Confederate flag outside of state houses and outside of courthouses and outside of public places. And if you want to have a fucking massive Stonewall Jackson statue in your front yard, and you want to hold a Confederate flag and have all those kinds of things on your front yard or on your private property, more power to you. I will protect to my death. You are very right to do that. And I have no problem with that. But let's understand that these symbols are loaded. The Confederacy was a slave protecting country founded by traitors and they deserve no place of reverence or honor amongst us here in the United States 150 years or so after they fell. This isn't about territorialism. This isn't about the victor's right, the history. This isn't about any of those kinds of things. It's about right and wrong. It's about reasonable and unreasonable. And it's about the United States still surviving to this day, surviving that secessionist plot, the 11 states leaving. Remember that there were four states that, that were slave-owning states that actually didn't even leave the Union. So this really does go down further than slaveholding and slave owning. It goes down to traitorous deeds. And those men that some people are trying to protect their statues of in places like New Orleans, those men are dastardly, disgusting traitors. And if we're going to have a statue of Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee somewhere, why don't we just go to Washington, D.C. and put a statue of Benedict Arnold in the middle of it? I mean, what's the difference? All right, that's it. That's my diatribe about the Confederacy, about Confederate remembrance, about the South, about these statues, about the Confederate flag and all that. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be very interested to hear what you think about it in the comments below. So let me know. I'll be there interacting with you as always. Please keep it respectful, whether it's to me or to other people. Thumb up the video if you liked it. Thumb it, thumb it down if you didn't. Um, please consider going to Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand to financially support this show. That is the only money that this show earns. I don't have ads turned on on YouTube right now, as you can see. That might change in the future, but it's not going to change right now. Um, I never will do product placement or product activations or anything like that. I think that shit's annoying. I don't want to deal with it. I know you don't want to deal with it. There's enough podcasts and videos out there that do that kind of shit. You won't find that here on Colin's Last Stand. I will waste no more of your time. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time. Keep on learning.